Oh, good morning. I'm Mark Carlson. I work for Kioxia. And uh, I'm going to talk this morning about managing Ethernet attached drives using Swordfish. Uh, Ethernet drives are kind of a new phenomenon. They're just now making their way out into the market. So that's what we'll talk about. Uh, you know, storage has evolved over the years. Um, certainly, it all started off being directly attached to the server, in the server. Um, and then, about the beginning of SNEA, which is 25 year old, as we'll find out tomorrow night in the party, um, they started to be this thing called storage area networks, or SANS. And uh, this was uh, to avoid the silos of storage and, and be able to put your data multiple places around the network. Um, obviously, Fiber Channel and iSCSI are storage networks, <clears throat> but they require storage controllers to turn what is uh, likely a, a non-network technology such as SAS, SATA, or NVMe into a network technology such as NVMe over fabrics or fiber channel. Um, and the hyperscalers were largely responsible um, <clears throat> for bringing it back uh, to direct attached storage. Um, they implement storage systems by using pizza box servers and a couple of SSD drives in them, right? And so that uh, does work for them. Uh, they don't want a separate network from what all the other systems are doing. They don't want a special fiber channel network or InfiniBand network or even an NVMe OF technology that uses converged Ethernet. So <clears throat> the industry is now moving to more of the NVMe, NVMe OF technology, uh, systems and devices on native interface Ethernet as a storage network. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, initially, it's just a transport. Uh, endpoints performed all the storage services such as iSCSI. And then the use of Ethernet matured, specialized protocols, key value protocol to access data in a mainframe context, other object protocol to access um, massive amounts of unstructured data. Um, now we've got NVMe over Ethernet, uh, storage in a queuing paradigm. Uh, this is what NVMe introduces. Uh, Submission queues and completion queues offer uh, the device the data as fast as it can take it. There's no you know, sort of waiting anymore, you just queue it up. <clears throat> so this brings high performance, low latency, fewer no processing blockages because of these queues. It's no longer gated by a transaction paradigm, you know, where you do something and wait for the NAC before you submit something else. And so the logical next step is NVMe over Ethernet to the drive. It removes the storage controller processing bottleneck. So NVMe over, F, over fabrics is uh, NVMe-OF. It's sharing NVMe-based storage across the network. Uh, better utilization capacity, rack space and power, better scalability, management, fault isolation. And the NVMe OF standard at NVMe Express organization has over 50 contributors. Uh, the first version was released in 2016. Um, and the type of fabrics it runs over besides Ethernet include InfiniBand and Fiber Channel as well. And now there's products in the market from most storage vendors that support NVMe OF. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll try and catch it before it goes too far. 
so some of the storage targets today include systems that terminate the NVMe OF connection um, on the front end, if you will, talking to hosts, and then put uh, PCIe-based SSDs behind the controller. This is a very typical situation if you buy an off-the-shelf server from any of major vendors out there. Um, however, the problem is SSDs are too goddamn fast. And when you start doing this kind of thing, you have to have a whole lot of compute in front of that storage in order not only just to uh, you know, queue up data that's going to and from those SSDs, but converting it, packetizing it, marshalling it onto the wire, and, and delivering it to the host, uh, the actual CPUs in that controller are a bottleneck. And SSD performance keeps increasing. Uh, this is due to the PCI bus itself increasing in speeds, doubling every year or two, right? And so now with uh, PCI version four, uh, lots of drives are shipping with that these days. Uh, next comes PCI five that doubles that again. Um, and so uh, SSDs that could fully keep four lanes of PCIe uh, are uh, increasing in performance and latency. And inside the SSD, there's a little piece of compute people don't realize. It's a system on a chip. So it's got CPU performance to keep that whole connection keep going at high speed. And, and those SOCs are getting faster and faster as well. Um, so what if you took that controller piece and put it inside the drive? Yes, it's gonna make your SOC get bigger. Uh, yes, that SOC is gonna have to run new kind of protocols that, uh, that they haven't had to before. PCIe is a fairly simple thing, and NVMe adds queuing over that to make it high performance. Uh, but now we want that SOC to marshal the stuff onto and off of the wire directly. So with NVMe OF termination on the drive itself, now that controller functionality is distributed to each of the drives. There's no central controller in the front of them. Um, what does that do? Well, it makes that easy to tune so that I can tune my Ethernet interface and the, and the required SOC changes for it to the speed of the drives. And so as I buy a drive, I'm getting exactly enough controller for that data that's on that drive. And uh, does this make each drive more expensive? Yes, because you have to pay for a bigger SOC, but you don't have to put a controller in front anymore. So this is like taking that controller cost and distributing it out to each drive. Makes sense? And that makes it more scalable because what you have to do today before Ethernet drives, you have to buy a controller regardless. Whether you put one, two, or 10 drives behind that controller, you've paid, you've sunk that cost into that controller. And so when you get to the 10th drive, you have to buy another controller and then fill that up with 10 drives, right? Here with Ethernet drives, you're buying a little chunk of controller each time you buy a drive, and so it scales much cleaner, much more regular cost and everything else, right? Um, and so now efficiencies of scale are now applied to controller functionality, and it lowers the cost of bandwidth and cost of IOPS. Um, so there is uh, existing JBOFs. This is just a bunch of flash, and it usually has um, a controller, again, in front of it because it's using PCIe SSDs. That controller, if, you're, if you do a PCIe fabric, a PCI switch, uh, you can get that JBOF to get to the hosts, or even multiple hosts, 
And this is what hyperscalers did originally, probably about three or four years ago, is they just introduced JBoss, PCIe JBoss, and put a PCI switch in front of it that would allow multiple hosts to talk to multiple drives um, without much of a controller at all. When, it, when you get to an Ethernet JBoff, right? Now all the Ethernet drives have native uh, Ethernet connections, so the only thing you need in the, in the JBoff or EBoff <laughs> is an Ethernet switch. You want to do dual port Ethernet switch, you can, or a single point of failure uh, Ethernet switch, you can. Um, but you don't want uh, to have more than just an Ethernet switch in your JBuff. So there's different ESSD designs today, um, uh, largely NVMe OF over Ethernet. Uh, some will support multiple interfaces and protocols like Rocky or TCP. Uh, TCP is a bit of a heavy lift still. Uh, on a Rocky, uh, which is starts, stands for RDMA over converged Ethernet, you have uh, what's called a lossless Ethernet. And uh, that, that makes it fairly straightforward to, to implement that product protocol in an SOC. So there's and there's an integration with the controller like I talked about. Uh, you could have an onboard chip that's not part of your SOC, or you can have a, a basically a bridge or dongle uh, that takes a PCIe interface and makes an Ethernet interface. Uh, this is probably the most expensive one uh, way to do that, but when you integrate it onto the chip into your SOC, you're gonna achieve uh, uh, scale and cost reduction for that. On the right there, you see the pinout that we came up with for Ethernet drives. So they can fit in a standard uh, connector that EBOS and JBOS have, um, and even uh, we, we take the PCIe lanes and overload them with Ethernet lanes instead. So uh, whether you have a PCI switch or an Ethernet switch depends on what kind of driver you would buy. And there's another use case of, of putting these things behind the controller. Uh, and this is so that your, your controller can be simplified, but also made more um, scalable itself, right? So if you have a controller in front of Ethernet drives, now you can expand those controllers separate from expanding the drive trays and scale to something like a rack, uh, rack-based system. So um, the data services are being done outside the drive still in these controllers but the actual marshalling of the data onto and off of Ethernet is done down in the drives. So there are some large controller manufacturers that are looking to use Ethernet drives as the back end, because again, PCIe doesn't scale very far. Uh, there's also this uh, notion of disaggregated storage. Today, the array controller handles conversion from NVMe OF to PCI-based drives. With e SSDs, Ethernet drives only require an Ethernet switch and fit into the EBOF for power, cooling, management, right? So we have a spec. SIA has a spec. It's out in a version 1.1 form. We're working on a version 1.2 at the moment, which will add some more capabilities to it. Um, so you want to be able to discover and configure the drives, their interfaces, their speeds, and their management capabilities. So some connectors may need to configure the PHY signals based on the type of dry interface. Uh, survivability and mutual detection is important. Uh, we want the pinouts for common connectors <clears throat> and form factors. Uh, we support the 8639 connector, which is what's used for two and a half and three and a half inch drives. Uh, and we also support 
the entire line of EDSF type drives as well. And then uh, NVMe OF integration, NVMe OF has not stayed uh, static over the years. It's a lot of new features have been added to it, including automated discovery, uh, configuration, uh, security such as TLS security and, and uh, authentication. Um, and those are uh, still coming from NVMe Express uh, organization. And then management through Ethernet TCP for data center wide management. If you have 10,000 of these drives in your data center, which is not an atypical number, right? Um, how do you manage 10,000 drives directly? Well, you need a management infrastructure that's as scalable as your physical and logical infrastructure, and that's achieved through Redfish, what Jeff just talked about in the last session. And Swordfish has come along in the last couple of years to better model what's in NVMe, all the different attributes you can do through the admin interface, all the things you can do through a BMC port uh, are now incorporated into Swordfish. And so it, it, you're able to go and find out what you can about these drives by using uh, a common port on, on the drive's Ethernet interface. So essentially it brings Redfish and Swordfish in band because it's on the same interface as your data is flowing. That can be good uh, if you don't want to pay for a separate port, just to have a management interface. Um, and the traffic on the management interface is so low that it doesn't really impact your I.O. much at all. So scale-out orchestration of tens of thousands of drives is now possible by using a red, RESTful API, such as DMTF Redfish. And Redfish Swordfish follow a principle that each element reports its own management interface information. And this is to prevent you from having to deploy sort of middle management <laughs> uh, to scale out your management, right? You have one management agent that uh, gathers data from a rack of drives. You don't need to do that with Redfish. You can go to each drive in that rack and get the information you need. So there is an NVMe OF drive interoperability profile. Jeff talked about profiles. This says for NVMe drives, NVMe OF drives, um, here's the typical configurations that you might want. And we do that through something called a mockup. A mockup is a static JSON file that uh, details how or what the, what the various parameters uh, look like what the various uh, operations are. Except. So what Swordfish does is they push new models through Swordfish contributions and then we publish the interoperability profile at DMTF. So where do you go to get Swordfish? DMTF. You also get it from CN. Uh, and then this profile maps to NVMe and NVMe uh, MI properties and actions. So. The Swordfish NVMe model overview and mapping guide helps you if you're coming from NVMe to understand what you need to do in Redfish and Swordfish. It's equivalent. So uh, my company makes a drive, Ethernet drive, and it has this profile implemented on it already. So it comes out of the box with the Redfish Swordfish interface. And several other companies are doing that as well. So we, we set out this off as a, a three-way effort, as an alliance partnership between DMTF and SNEA, which is a long-time partnership, but we've added also NVM Express organization uh, to that partnership. And um, we have this base manageability for NVMe devices. <clears throat> so we can manage individual and aggregate devices and environments at scale. It provides a clear map for NVMe folks that don't know Redfish, Redfish, in order to understand that. 
and uh, de detailed implementation guidance for those interfaces covering multiple NVMe F device types. So fitting the standards together, Redfish Swordfish uses the available low-level transports to get device transport specific information into the common models. Um, this could be done with RDE, which is also something Jeff talked about, Redfish device enablement, which is a compressed form of, re uh, of a response to a Redfish or Swordfish request. Um, and that can be used. It's not part of NVMe MI today, but uh, it could be. Uh, so that would be the NVMe organization coming back and, and uh, it makes your BMC a lot simpler if it doesn't have to take MI information and convert it into swordfish information. If it can get the swordfish profile elements out of the drive directly, even if it's a PCIe drive, uh, the BMC can be simply translating that to the full-on JSON implementation of Redfish and Swordfish outside of it. Typically, the BMC will always have an Ethernet interface to it so that you can manage the entire box through that BMC. So some of the major objects that we mapped over to Redfish and Swordfish, obviously, NVM subsystem is what you would call a controller inside the drive, uh, but there's also something called a controller. You can have multiple controllers per subsystem. Uh, so think of the con controllers as handling the traffic from one port. So if you have a dual port PCIe drive, there's two controllers. If you have uh, four ports on your drive, that's four controllers. And this is just a logical construct inside the device so you can tell what speed it's running at and blah, 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 right? And then namespaces. Uh, namespace is a, a, a sort of like a target in SCSI in that it's a specific area uh, that's carved out for you to use. You can mount it under a controller and then you can send and receive data to it. Endurance group is, is uh, what the drive is told to wear level. So if you have multiple namespaces, and they're all part of a single endurance group, the drive is doing wear leveling across those four namespaces. Uh, NVM SAT is a somewhat useless concept that, that most uh, uh, configuration software ignores. <laughs> and then NVMe dom NVM domain is used for very large systems that have uh, multiple power cords coming to them. And so they, they could fail a certain portion of their namespaces when that power goes away. <clears throat> so this is a model uh, for SSD subsystem model. Uh, and it's a bit of an eye chart. I apologize for that. But Jeff's pictures are even worse. <laughs> So this is the ESSD use case, but you basically start at the top. I don't know if I can, oh yeah, you can get, kind of see my mouse. And, and things are, are subordinate to the main object until you get down to an actual namespace. And this is a, a instance view. So uh, there are a bunch of instances. So, so you have a class called namespace, but then you have four instances of that class. Right? It's all object-oriented <laughs> and RESTful. And so this, this allows you to put everything together that you see coming out of that Redfish port. And who is developing it? Well, this is a, a list of folks that have participated either in Swordfish or Redfish or both. And you can see the, the number of companies that are both is significant. <laughs> Cox, <you>, sir. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, 
I left lots of time for questions. <laughs> uh, there's lots of places to find more info. Um, <clears throat> From the SNEA Swordfish, uh, there's uh, SNEA.org slash swordfish is your good starting point there. I also have a forum, like there's a redfish forum, there's a swordfish forum. Uh, you, you don't have to be a SNEA member to join the forum and ask questions. Um, there's also a scalable storage management TWIG, technical work group in SNEA, and this is where all the swordfish work happens. Uh, if anybody remembers SMIS, this is where SMIS was done. And that was a long time ago. Maybe not 25 years, but close to it. Um, and then there's a storage management initiative. And w what we call initiatives inside of SNEA is a group that's going to do marketing and education and show up at events like this or help produce them. So th that's something to join. And then you can go to dmtf.org slash standards slash redfish. Is that the best URL, Jeff? Probably, yeah. yeah. There's also an open fabric management framework. Uh, there's an OFMF working group. Um, and uh, there, you can join that, op openfabrics.org. Uh, is working with DMTF to uh, better model the fabrics that are out there. And then, of course, NVM Express. Um, that URL may be changing soon. I don't know. We're, we're finally getting rid of Kavi <laughs> in NVM Express and going to the Causeway like everybody else has, except for Insights. That isn't always a smooth thing. Okay. Yes, Jeff. Where's the Rosetta Stone doc? That's an NVMe mapping guide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name of the doc that maps go through the Yeah, that's uh, NVMe model overview and mapping guide on the bottom here. So you can get that from the Swordfish download. We get basically give you a zip file, and in that zip file is that guide. And it just goes, you know, for an MI command to do a format of a namespace, here's how you map that into Swordfish. And it assumes knowledge of NVMe and assumes you don't know anything about redfish and swordfish. So it brings you up that learning curve at the time you're implementing your driver. Other questions? So can you go to your picture? Please. That one? Yeah. So the objects on the right are the NVMe objects? Yeah. Because NVMe means it's an NVMe concept. Subsystem, controller, namespace. So the green arrows mean they're equivalent object from the IO controller in NVMe to a Redfish Swordfish controller. Storage maps to subsystem, volume maps to namespace. And then there's chassis, a concept that you talked about. And within the chassis is a drive, but there's also a network adapter, whether it's physical or logical, and that has a port and a device function. Make sense? Yeah. Where's the drive maps that may be tapped? What about the? The drive and the uh, swap map to the may be. Because there's no direct. This? Yes. That comes from Redfish, not Swordfish, actually. Yeah, but well, there's no menu. Yeah. You have to go to the Rosetta Stone document to figure out what attributes come from where. Yeah. Because it does come from the right side, which is not the point. Yeah, but there's no concept in, uh, 
and envy of me of a drive, yeah. right? Because there could be a whole subsystem out there that you're talking to, not just a single drive. In this case, because this is a model that comes out of a single drive, uh, there's only one, okay. right? But if you, if you use that model in front of a system with tens of drives, then there would be tens of drives in there. You'd see a picture of each one of those drives, and that's how you get to the storage and the volumes. How can you tell what? From the domain stack, how many drives are there? Yeah, so when you, when you put in an SSD, how, many, how do you know how many drives are there? Ah, well, so you can discover it two ways. Redfish has a discovery mechanism itself. But in recent years, NVMe OF has added uh, something called MDNS discovery. So it uses the messaging DNS uh, server to come back and say, well, there's a drive over here, and here's its Ethernet address. That's not drive server and subsystem. It works for subsystem as well. Yeah, that's what I said. Really, all you want is the Ethernet address of the drive. And then a special port on that is it. What is the port number, Jeff? Default port number for Redfish interface. 8080? Yeah, you could really set it to anything, but you might use 8080 consistently throughout your environment. And then there's a specific URL to, to go and fetch the top of that tree using HTTP. You know, HTTP GAT at that Ethernet address, IP address, and then uh, specify a, a URL that gets you to the top of everything, which I don't have here. I'll be honest, because I helped with the Rosetta Stone, and the nomenclature issue that you're bringing up, there's no concept of drive. And what they call a controller, I would have called a connection. Yeah. And yeah, you see, yeah, exactly, you're shaking your head, yes, but no, you know. It took us months to come together on nomenclature to figure out, okay, now I know what you mean by this, and get the Rosetta Stone out of the Yeah, and the Swordfish and Redfish groups, they had no knowledge of NVMe. Right. And so, so, so we went that direction to create this, <laughs> and now we, we've actually documented it going the other direction. So if you know NVMe, here's how you get to Redfish and Swordfish. Right. So expect to see this continue to evolve as we add more concepts that are brought into NVMe and then map them out into Swordfish and Redfish. And there are more models than this, right? Yeah, no, this is just a small glimpse, yeah. So I guess one question I have is, is how does Swordfish handle dynamic controllers? On a system like a pure storage system, it would, uh, it would show up in the model when you looked at uh, things called collections. So you, you can have a, a collection of I.O. controllers that appear and disappear when you're doing fabric connections, right? So remember what I said about usually a controller per port? Well, in this case, it's a controller per connection. Uh, whether it's Ethernet or uh, other fabric type things. Controllers up there is a collection with controller instances in it. Same storage, yeah. same with drive, same with volume. Yeah. These can all be collections if you're talking about a system instead of just a drive. It just looks easier to put some Yeah. So we've done uh, modeling of JBOFs, EBOFs, uh, controller based. Subsystems, etc. Mm -hmm. We have yet to uh, map some of the discovery. 
Uh, we've been waiting on this one TP called 6011. <laughs> it seems to never get out of committee. Uh, but 60, what 6011 does is it allows you to take a drive and split it up. Uh, each namespace possibly being accessed by different hosts, which is all possible due to uh, removing of the PCIe limitations. So that will be coming soon. And we're working, like I said, on 1.2 of the NVMe over fabrics uh, drive, native NVMe over fabrics drive spec. Any more questions? All right, thank you.